Okay, today on Standing on the Shoulders of Giants, we have with us Jose Barrera. Jose, you have a pretty stellar background in artificial intelligence, computer science, among other things. And also, wow, you had a really, really amazing, you have some really amazing stories from growing up in like 80s and 90s Colombia. And there's some, some, some pretty pretty famous things, especially with, with various TV shows that have recently come out, et cetera. So I'd love, um, I'd love a little bit of background. Can we, can we dive in? What, what caused you to go into AI? What's, what's, um, what's your current, current role, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I think life took me to AI uh, because it's the thing now. And, and usually what happens is that possibilities arise in the market based on, on demand. So it's the new things, right? Like at the time of probably most of the audience is young enough to remember this, but at the time of the dot com boom, like naturally the markets attracted people towards that, right? So I think finance, those those like hedge funds, that that kind of things are the, the things that are hot in the economy, uh, are the ones that attract and, and bring people in, right? Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, was there was there a specific catalyst for things that were were really interesting um, about artificial intelligence, or was it just computer science in general? And then you happened to fall into AI. I happened to fall into AI, and to tell you the truth, I is not my forte. It's not like my my strength, my real strength, because uh, at the time when I was uh, studying computer science and, and so on, uh, AI, even though it has a long history. Uh, was not a big thing, right, um, among uh, most people, but was very specialized. And in, in, now it, it has become a trend in, in the last couple of years. And anyone who wants to sell any piece of software now has to say that it's AI. <laughs> Even if it's not, they, they say that now. So uh, my, my, my real background, right, is in computer languages and compilers and human-machine interaction. So that's and data visualization. That's that's my forte, really. But the, throughout the years, through being spooned through and working with all these very talented people, uh, I, I got to learn uh, a little bit of AI. Awesome. And then your your current your current company is Elemental Cognition. Is, is they, as I understand it, as a pretty strong AI mission. Uh, correct, correct. The company was uh, founded by Dave Ferrucci. Dave Ferrucci is basically the guy who uh, run the team at Watson, a uh, famous Watson from IBM. Uh, for people who don't know about it, uh, there was this, there is this uh, very famous popular TV show called Jeopardy. And after we have conquered the, the horizon of playing chess, one of the big next horizons in, in, in artificial intelligence was to be able to beat the questions at, at, at Jeopardy. And uh, this team at IBM uh, created a piece of software called Watson in honor of the founder of IBM, uh, who actually won uh, against the, the US champion of, of Jeopardy. So that's what uh, brought these to fame and, and basically made Watson known. And it, it's used today in, in uh, various fields and it became something popular basically after that. Uh, from there, I, I, I met Dave and that's one of the things why I ended up working at, 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 uh, with him is because of, of, of Watson, right? Because I, I'm very interested in those things. So that's why I ended up there. And it's a startup that has been around for, for some time now. And we have like 45 people. And what we do is hybrid uh, artificial intelligence. What's hybrid artificial intelligence? So basically uh, you have two sides, right? Like what, what people are know most of they know is they know neural networks and they know chat GPT and those things that you hear now every day. Uh, but those models are statistical models, basically, that what they do is they tell you they, they're trained on a set of data and they learn. If I tell you, uh, tell me a red, what, what I'm thinking about a red fruit, what is the fruit I'm thinking of? You would say. 
Me, I'm weird. I'd probably say strawberry, but maybe you want me to say apple. <laughs> Correct. But but you see, you you want you knew that I want you to because it's the most probable thing, and uh, most uh, like we humans have a, a strong or we work in in that way, right? Like uh, we do a lot of, of these kind of guesses all the time in language. We are not aware of that. Uh, so these networks are trained on that, and but there is statistical models where they've been trained with a lot of data, a lot of language. Uh, texts and they they're able to guess what is the next if i ask something i can say what is the next probable thing that the most probable thing that i should say to this based on all the information that i have but that's the extent of them that's that's all they do and and we can do very impressive things with them with the massive amounts of data that we have but but they they're lacking right so uh, the the analogy is our brain so we have an intuitive side that would be that the, the, sto the stochastical side, where where you're basically guessing, and then the other one is where where you reason, and and when you reason is that you have a model in your head about what reality is or or the problem that you're trying to solve, and then you you know rules or inference rules about that, and you can follow them to come to conclusions. So uh, I think this kind of approach, which is very similar to what we humans do. Uh, is the right approach to to uh, future AI because it makes up for the for the shortcomings that that only using stochastical models have. Right? Okay, you're you're mentioning stochastic quite a bit, and I, I'm relatively familiar with stochastic versus deterministic. But do we want to explain that for sort of the listeners? Uh, sure. So. Uh, if I have a set of rules, right, A implies B, B implies C, C implies D, and I have A, then I can I can say, oh, D, I can deduce D because it's deterministic in the sense that the rules, if you follow the rules, you inevitably are going to end up on that on that D if you start with A. Uh, when when you're talking about something that is probabilistic, is that you know the answer. But but you have uh, probabilities of what are the, the the most likely outcomes, and then you can follow those chains. And but it's undetermined; it's just probabilistic, so you can come up to to those kind of answers from there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think something I've I've heard reasonably often is um, it compared to a gumball machine. When you put in one quarter, you're guaranteed to get one gumball each time. So therefore, it's deterministic, but it's also stochastic in the sense of you never know what color it's going to be. So it's also very random. Yeah, that's a perfect, perfect analogy. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in your work with <laughs> artificial intelligence, have you come across any moral conundrums? Mm. Me personally, sure. <laughs> uh, probably not. There is is latent there, right? Like like when you when you're creating software to, to when when you have to make decisions and people have to make decisions. Uh, if you come up with the wrong answer, people can be making a, a decision that is costly, right? Uh, so so there are segments or, or, or parts of, of our economy or, or of knowledge in general, where you have to be very damn sure that you're giving the right answer because a lot of money or a lot of uh, even lives could, could depend on that. So I used to work like writing the trading software before for a long time and I was in FinTech. And any error that you put in your code is, it could be like cost millions of dollars. So, so it's always there, right? And I can only imagine the responsibility of people that are trying to create automated cars. <laughs> I think, I don't know how those guys sleep every night. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can definitely understand that. Well, we've sort of talked a bit offline about some of the, let's say, moral conundrums that could cut up, come up with AI. Mm -hmm. How do we... First of all, can we identify a couple of those? And second of all, what what would we do to mitigate those, or can we mitigate them? Okay, so the so for example, and I heard uh, one of your guests before talking about this in 
automated cars. You come to a split second decision where do I kill the granny that is crossing the street or do I save the driver, right? That kind of thing. Uh, so I think the you have to look to nature to see answers for any problem. And the fact that every person is an individual and you're making those decisions every at, the, at every moment, what that and every person is different, then that means that the algorithm or the recipe that you're using to make that decision is a slightly different on every person or very different on every person. So what happens is that there is no a central place where a nerd in front of a computer is doing a value calculation where he's saying, oh, I'm, I'm going to go for the granny because I love my granny, right? Or whatever. But the beauty is that in nature, nature is running various experiments or like and a, and a multiplicity of experiments at every second. And each of them is different. So it's distributed in the sense that every single driver of a car has a different background, a different set of skills and so on, which means that in a, on average, what's going to happen is only going to happen once, right? Because that person is a particular case. Now, if you have a, a fatal flaw inside one of these self-driven cars, then you're going to kill all the grannies or, or you're going to save all the passengers or whatever is going to happen. And I think so the, the, the biggest solution to these problems is decentralization, right? Like having diversity in the way you do things, uh, which is what nature does at every moment, right? Like nature is a, a big experiment on diversity, basically. That's that's what we are, right? Like trial and error at every second on every decision. For sure. I think one of the more interesting things about that is I believe as, as humans, we're just starting to realize that these are all, that even though they're very different basis for systems that they are just yeah. systems. So nature is effectively, it's, you know, it's using biology and cellular structure, whereas computer science, like we work on, we actually are, are doing very similar things, but we're doing it with electrons and theoretically significantly less consequences, but because we're not, we're not making and destroying biological entities. Right. Um, right. Which is interesting because then then you end up getting to this sort of the question of you know the, the question that's on everybody's mind since chat G, chat GPT and and things of that nature is sort of the AGI right the um, the artificial general intelligence the HAL nine thousand the Star Trek computer the right the big scary Every nerd's dream <laughs> dream but at the same time it seems like a lot of people are also making significant. I don't know, either you you would say money, but they're definitely garnering significant attention by effectively being doomsayers for the AGI is going to kill us all or it's going to turn into right. Skynet and Terminator or whatever. And there's there's definitely some interesting stuff there. Mm -hmm. um, what, do you, what are your thoughts on some of the AGIs? Okay, so, yeah, I understand where these doomsayers come from. And... If history is a good teacher, right? Like, look at what we, the first thing that we did when we split the atom, what was it, right? Like, <laughs> we, 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 we created atomic bombs with it, exactly. So if that's a good, like, if past behavior is, is a good indicator of, of future behavior, then I understand where they're coming from, right? Because these things can be easily weaponized in many ways. And I can see how this could happen, especially when you have economies that are driven by by, by the military in, in many cases, right? And it's a, a lot of funding in a lot of places comes from from the U.S. military. I, to, to give you an example, when I worked like my first job at, at uh, when when I first came here to the United States was at the Department of uh, Neuroscience at NYU. And uh, the biggest funding was from the U.S. Navy. <laughs> like you would think, like why is the U.S. Navy investing in neuroscience? But yeah, it's, it's humanitarian reasons, of course. So, so that's the nature of the thing: is that we 
we live in a society where our technology advances because of the investment on thinking on 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 how to advance like every single piece of technology that we have today if you think where it comes from has military bases or applications at some point in the past so so the laser surgery on your eyes comes from lasers that they're weapons basically or they were studied first studied as weapons and to create lightsabers like in star wars right that hasn't happened yet unfortunately it's it, it's interesting because I think you're right. A lot of times, brand new technology is, ex, is first exploited exploited for warfare, and then mm-hmm. eventually turned into something good. Like you know, nuclear power is powering all, like something like ninety five yeah. percent of France, a huge portion of the United States, etc. But you're right, we Absolutely. turn it into, into bombs first. Um, Absolutely, and and the problem with that is that as we control more power because the tools that we make are more powerful than the impacts and the this, the possible destructive uh, possibility, like the destructive power of those things is bigger, right? So like, just like, I find it in, absolutely crazy that the first atomic explosion in Nevada, the Trinity experiment, there was a theoretical possibility that the chain reaction that they created with the explosion would basically react with the oxygen and the hydrogen in the atmosphere and would ignite the atmosphere of the planet. But they still decided to go ahead and do the, 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 the donation, right? Because it was it was more important to win the war than to annihilate the whole the whole planet. So is that kind of judgment is, is really, really scary when you think about it. I agree that the Manhattan Project definitely was had some some very crazy things. It had some really interesting things come out of it. Uh, Monte Carlo method, among other things, uh, von Neumann, and and obviously Oppenheimer being after that staunchly anti um, anti atomic weapons, uh, right. and a bunch that, of U.S. generals like Eisenhower as well. <laughs> yeah. In fact, that was one of the, it's one of the more famous uh, U.S. president's final speeches is uh, Eisenhower warning about the military industrial complex. I believe he was the last five-star general ever in the United States. And then he became president and he was specifically warning, Hey, this is a real, like, this is a real problem. We've, (laughs) we've unleashed something. Um, That said, before we, before we continue down that path, I did want to go back to the AGI for just a half second. And at what point in time do you, I guess my question is more along the lines of, how would we know that we even created the AGI? I mean, this is this is one of the things that I've always been curious about. When we recognize true consciousness, when we've created it, um, I've theorized that it could be the result. Honestly, I've, I've literally theorized that the AGI would end up resulting from a runaway optimizer and that we wouldn't do it on purpose. It would actually be almost an accident. It would be on purpose in the sense of the code is designed to get better. The code is designed to learn. The code is designed to absorb, but someone does sort of a runaway optimizer that connects to everything and it, and it continues to optimize and optimize and optimize. And at a certain point, not only is it overwriting its own code, but something occurs to where it's now conscious. My question is, what do you think that something might be? Because I, can, I can't even, right. I can't I, even I, think through what that might look like. I don't think that's the right path to create uh, consciousness. Uh, I think consciousness, just like, uh, is the secretion of our brain. So if if it is produced by the brain at all, but basically self-awareness that expresses itself in space, time, and, and, and the reality as we see it, colors, and the sensations, qualia, qualia is, is the word. Uh, that thing, I, I think, is is being being human is what creates that being sentient, and more than that, metacognition, right? Like the not because a dog is 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 conscious, but it cannot think about its own consciousness, or at least we we know because we have not been able to ask them, or for them are interested in intelligence, but uh, that thing, like. The problem is that at every generation, there is a defining technology that ends up being the paradigm that we use to measure the world. 
So when they first came up with clocks and watches, people start thinking that humans are watches and clocks, right? And uh, and then we became like when you start having the steam machine and, and uh, the industrial revolution, then we were steam machines. And and now because the technology that we have is like the the, the parallel that we have is computers, we think that we are computers and we model ourselves as oh the brain is a big computer and so on but uh, to me that's that's you're anthropomorphizing your your technology and the other thing is that that is super interesting is that technology changes us so it's not that we're just creating technology but we live in this symbiotic relationship with the technology that we create and I don't like to call it artificial, right? Like the, the constructs that we do, because I think we as humans, that's what we produce, right? Like just like the ants produce the ant nests and we produce technology, we produce tools and they're as natural as everything else that nature creates. So, but the problem with that technology and, and those tools that we create is that they're not neutral, but they get into our psyche and create the metaphors that we live by. Uh, so, so that question of, of like, if you want to create a smart being, I can think of a better way to do it. It's fun. You don't need clothes and you have a good time and then, but you have to feed it for 15 years until it grows up. Right. Uh, so that's the best way to create intelligence. If you like human intelligence, you want to mimic that. M machines don't have the experience that we have. And I think a big part of the way we behave and so on is that we have these very basic needs, right? That come from our instincts and our emotions and our feelings and in order to fulfill them, then we create all these tools around us and we create these mechanisms of thinking and, and codifying things in language and all that to fulfill those necessities. But if you create a machine that only creates the, the aftermath, that is the thinking without the motives for that thinking, then is that truly, I, I don't know, right? Like I think being human is a big part of, of being intelligent in the way we understand intelligence, right? Because you look at the Amazon and, and that thing is intelligent in its own way. And in, in ways that we don't even understand because we, 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 we don't share the same set of values or because values are human, not, not, not Amazonica, like they're not forest. They're, but these things clearly have a, a, a way of living and a way of doing things in a very particular and very wise way when you look in, in, in retrospective. But the, the thing is that we cannot anthropomorphize them and therefore we don't ascribe intelligence to them because we cannot relate to them. So even if you had aliens that came to Earth tomorrow, how would you recognize that they're intelligent? I mean, you, you, you don't have a standard to measure that we, we only have ourselves and, and what we do, the way we look at the world is we put a mirror everywhere and we measure everything our, against ourselves. So a true alien, which is completely different to us, we wouldn't, wouldn't even recognize it, right? Like whatever, you would say that's a cloud or whatever. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, besides the fact that of course it required human actors, I think Star Trek was actually pretty pretty good about this. and. They literally classified nearly everything as humanoid and the things that weren't humanoid besides the fact that I'm sure that it was more expensive for special effects and <laughs> it's much more difficult to relate. Usually those were the things that they really didn't get along with very well, whereas like these big amorphous blobs of nonsense that had no human characteristics. So I, I, I definitely understand where you're going with that one. Um, that said, it's, it's, an, it, yeah, it's an interesting thing. Because we talk about consciousness as the ability to think about its own thinking. And I, I, I think you're right. I don't think dogs can do that. I don't <clears> think <throat> dolphins can do that. I'm not sure monkeys can do that. It's more than thinking to me. It's awareness of your own awareness. Because awareness and thinking are different. Like, like 
the fact that you can sense like like that you can sense what a taste is or that you can perceive colors in a way that is not linguistic is is basic to your core and it's undescribable at the end right like i i can i can give you certain properties of the wavelength of colors and all those things but those things are totally orthogonal from the qualia or qualia because because qualia that thing is unnameable is the experience itself is it cannot be expressing words beyond poetry yeah i just by the way i just looked that up it seems like qualia just for the listeners is a term that philosophers use to describe the nature or content of our subjective experiences by the way that's a really great word um from quality I've heard it multiple times. I don't think I've ever actually used it though. So nice. Right. I'm, I'm getting... It comes from quality. Is that the same root as quality? That makes sense. Uh, um, okay. So um, that said, speaking of all this yeah. meta human and things of this nature, I think a lot of us were introduced via a couple of different TV shows to something called magical realism, which is ah. very much a Colombian thing as I understand it. Right. Um, you grew up in Bogota throughout the 80s and 90s, etc. What was that like? Correct. So, actually, Dave is trying to be politically correct. He's talking about Narcos, my friends. <laughs> well, there's multiple Bro, different. <laughs> there's multiple shows, but Narcos <laughs> is one of them. Yes. <laughs> is is uh, drug dealing in, in in Latin America, and the problem with black markets, right? Like. You guys experience in the here in the time of the prohibition as well, is that it creates the root the most they become the most profitable markets, and they attract the most ruthless people, uh, and that's what happened in Colombia. And basically, I grew up there. I, I went to high school uh, at the height of the war on drugs in Colombia, where Pablo Escobar was the richest man on earth. Like you can think about that one. <laughs> it, it, he was so wealthy that in order to exchange for that, that the, the justice system in Colombia would leave him alone, he proposed to pay the external debt of Colombia yeah. from his own pocket. Yeah. That's how wealthy he was. Like, imagine, imagine just to put it in, 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 in perspective, imagine that the how much is $32 trillion, like the liabilities of the U.S., or like the debt, the external debt of the United States? Or is I, think, or I, th I think I think the, the external debt at present, I think it's actually only $8 trillion. It's $8 trillion. Okay, imagine it's $8 trillion and, and you have a guy so wealthy, you say Bill Gates comes tomorrow and, and he's dealing in drugs or something like this. That's why it's called magical realism, because it's magical, right? It's, these things are like so extreme and absurd that is hard to but imagine that imagine that bill gates is doing vaccines but he's dealing cocaine underneath the the table and and he's so wealthy that the government is chasing him and he decides you know what if you leave me alone i'm gonna pay the debt of the united states one individual that's how profitable that thing was so i grew up in a place where that was what happened and, and basically that turned the, the whole society upside down uh, because all of a sudden you have to have all this new money that is flooding Colombia. And is these very violent people, They're, they were called the Sicarios, who were the mobsters, basically the hitmen. And, and they had fancy cars and all this. And I remember when I was growing up, like I was probably like 19, 20. So we used to go clubbing with my friends. I'm, I'm like first year of college or something like that. We go to a club. We're in the middle of the club, we're dancing, and all of a sudden you, you hear a big explosion, like boom, and then the whole place shakes, right? Like the music stops, the lights blink, everybody's like freezes. One, two, three, four, five, nothing else happens. The music goes up again, and everybody keeps dancing. That was like, you get used to anything. I remember when I was in Colombia, I had a girlfriend. I was driving her back home. I was probably 20. I'm driving her back home one night and there is a car in front of us. We're on a light 
waiting for the light to go. It's like probably like two o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden a motorcycle comes and cuts us in where it stops right in the middle between us and, and the car and the light. The guy gets the guy in the motorcycle gets a machine gun and guns out the car in front of me. Wow. So I'm in the car, so I back up and take a side road and run away. But that's that's the kind of place I grew up in. It, it was like incredible, unbelievable. Wow. I'm I mean, first of all, I'm glad you made it out of there. But second oh, of all, yeah. I I've, I've been to um I was actually in Colombia about two or three years ago, uh, mm -hmm. specifically actually in in Medellin, where where um, Pablo was from, and I actually went mm -hmm. to Barrio de Pablo Escobar, and it was um, it was r really interesting. Apparently, the story that I heard was he paid this unbelievable amount of money to relocate all these people um, from this like sort of floodplain at the bottom of uh, at the bottom of not at the bottom of Medellin, but like at the bottom of the county that Medellin is in, mm -hmm. and then brought them all up into the city, into this one neighborhood, and bought houses for literally every single one of them. So I, I do so, understand that some people really, I mean, to this day, they consider him an absolute saint. They consider him a hero for a lot of the stuff absolutely. that he did. Absolutely. He was, he was adored by, by the people who he who take, uh, took care of in Colombia. And, and one of the reasons why he was f so hard to catch is because he used to get into these, uh, the, in, he's called barriadas, which are these, these uh, slums. And, and, and people used to hide him in their houses and it was a big honor for them to, to hide him. And he, and up to today, I think, I think today after they have made so many shows about him and so on, there's a lot of people that, that think very highly of him, right? Not the people who died in his bombs and all this, but, but there's people who he changed their lives for the good in, in many ways because he gave them money, right? Like he, with all these, at the time, it's like millions and millions of dollars. <laughs> he gave millions and millions of dollars to all these people. One funny story. This story is hilarious about Colombia. So uh, he used to have a farm like a big hacienda. And he learned that wild animals, like, like big game animals, like wild animals from Africa, the feces of these animals basically scare the, the, the dogs that are trained to catch cocaine. So what he used to do is in order to, to export his drugs, he used to take the, the manure, the, the feces of these animals, and he used to take the packages of cocaine and cover them with that. So when they were imported, the dogs used to sniff them and run away, right? So when he was captured, his zoo, his hacienda was abandoned and the animals escaped. And one of the animals that he had, like a lot of them were hippos, hippopotamus. I've heard so about he this. Got this all is, these, yeah. he, it's wild because they're, they're native from the Nile River and they were all the, only there. They have no natural predator, even in, in Egypt, right? Uh, so they brought him to Colombia, and now they're a pest. There are so many of them, and they've been killing all the natural wildlife and so on because they don't have natural predators, And but which is a good thing in a way because an animal that was supposed to be near extinction in, 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 in the Nile now is alive and well doing in, in South America because of Pablo Escobar. So that's, that's magical realism for you. It's it, yeah, it's true. I heard about that. There's <laughs> apparently there are hippos all over the place and they've managed to breed and go all everywhere. And yeah, there's just, they're, they're literally apex predators, top of the food chain. Nothing and, and comes you look after at hippos. Them, you look at them and they're so cute. And so no, they're brutal. Oh, they're they scary. Behead, they behead lions. Like he's crazy. Anything that takes on a lion is is <laughs> oh, yeah. is definitely t top of the food chain. Um, that said, what was the route? So you you grew up in Colombia. Um, definitely have some amazing stories about that. And then, uh, is there something in particular? What, what did uh, was it co a computer science in particular that that you you wanted to move to the U.S. Uh, <clears throat> so at the time I was, I was, I was in college at the time of all these stories. 
And there is a, a very renowned Colombian scientist in neuroscience. And he was working with Colombia. It was like a, the, the Colombian government at the time wanted to improve the living situation in Colombia. So he, the, the, the government asked the, the, the big figures in, in, in Colombia to make a think tank to see how they could improve the situation in Colombia. Uh, so they did so, and this scientist, his name is Rodolfo Linas, uh, he was the dean of uh, NYU uh, Physiology and, and Neuroscience at the time. He decided that he wanted to make some software for edu educational software to bring to schools and so on. And at the time I was doing college there, and I ended up working in this project, building the software for him. And he liked my work and asked me if I wanted to come here to work for him at, at NYU Medical Center. And that's how I and I came for a couple of years and 30 plus years later, I'm still here. There you go. Awesome. Yeah. It's funny because our mutual friend has decided to do the opposite. She's from, what, I, I can't remember where Drea was born. Drea was born, I think she's, she's from Idaho. I want to say Idaho which is like the most white bread place in, the, in, this, in, in the country. It's just, I mean, very, very little happens up there. And then now she's in the middle of the Colombian Amazon, I believe with her shaman boyfriend. <laughs> yeah. I, I heard your podcast with her. She's an explorer and adventurer, like, and she's in a very, very nasty spot in Colombia. basically. Like in the oh yeah. She's, it's pretty wild. I'm, I'm in shock that she's, well, to be honest with you, I would be in shock if it were anybody else. I'm <laughs> actually not in shock because it's Drea. <laughs> she's definitely an amazing explorer and whatnot, but she's doing a pretty awesome thing down there. She's doing, you know, the, uh, the carbon credits. And actually she, um, she's talking with a bunch of the shaman who apparently have like pretty good relations with the narcos and like, listen, you know, one way or the other, we need to, we need to basically keep the, this forest around. Um, so she's doing, she's doing some really great work down there. I the, wish her good luck, man. Tough, <laughs> tough job. She's a tough, she's, she's a tough cookie. <laughs> That's the thing. She, I mean, if there's anybody who can get it done, it's Drea. There's no question about that. Um, that said, so like, again, we were sort of talking last week a little bit about this, and I kind of wanted mm -hmm. to jump back into it, which was, where can we go with this consciousness as far as like AGIs are concerned? Is there a preliminary step? So for instance, right now, basically AI is, is pattern recognition, right? It's a lot of linear algebra that does, it's really, mm -hmm. really good at pattern recognition. Um, it's also really good at probability. That's, I mean, a probability, uh, chat GPT is effectively a probability engine top to bottom. And these are all examples of narrow AI. How do we widen narrow AI such that we eventually combined it and get this sort of AGI, right? So you've got, we, we've kind of talked about some of the consciousness things, but we've kind of <clears> agreed <throat> that in order for humans to realize that it's conscious, it needs to sort of mimic some sort of human consciousness. Therefore, it's going to need cognition for some definition of that word, it's going to need visualization, some type of sensory experience, definitely a lot of NLP, so natural language processing like chat G GPT has. Um, it may even need locomotion, potentially. I mean, assuming we put it in a robot or something like that. I want to, and again, this is to DARPA, be able to... You want one of those creepy DARPA dogs with yeah. intelligence? Yeah, those are weird. I, I mean, I, people people are seeing those around Boston and like freaking out. Like, what is that thing? For for the listeners, if you if you sort of Google these things, there's some DARPA projects and some, I believe there's also Boston Robotics and a couple of other different places that are kind of coming together to do these weird looking robotic dogs that that are autonomously roaming the city and doing. I mean, they're not really doing anything other than roaming the city and capturing video, et cetera. But yeah, they're they're creepy. Have you seen the one with machine guns on top? That's that's the creepiest one. <laughs> I mean, I mean, with that that always brings me back to sort of that that Black Mirror episode. Did you ever see that one, Metalhead? It's the one where I think human beings are not quite dead yet, but like we're on the verge of extinction, and there are these metal dogs running around chasing us all over the place. 
Um, it's pretty, it's pretty brutal. I mean, Black Mirror is, is in my opinion, it's sort of the new Twilight Zone, but with with a much more, you know, sci-fi techno uh, yeah, outlook. Pretty... Yeah. So how do we get to that AGI? Like, what do, what would what would what would the steps even be? And right. So so the first question is, do we want to be there? Do we want to go there? Number you one. know someone's going to go there. It's just like you said. Someone's yeah. going to go there. That's going to happen. And it'll Correct. probably start with military. Correct. So, yeah, I think the, the first thing is that you need to ground these in reality, right? Like, so to these electric dreams that you're producing with, with chat GPT, you have to be able to take those electric dreams and, and confront them with reality, right? And measure if what they what it's saying is not just a runaway hallucination as they're called, or, or if it has some basis, which actually is, is one of the biggest problems with, with that kind of technology is, and, and is what we're trying to, to solve in, in my, my current company is exactly that, right? Like, how do you make sure that when this thing comes up with a very convincing story, because it says it in a very convincing way, how do you know that you can fact check that and know that that's true? Right? So for any for any real life application of this, where you are making decisions that affect people, you have to be able to to verify that whatever concoction this thing came with matches reality, right? Or what you're trying to do, because otherwise it could have catastrophic uh, consequences. So so I think number one is that, and that's what we're working on now number two is that sorry, those just, things are sorry just to clarify number one is attempting to ascertain the the reason that the you want to create it the validity of what what chat gpt comes with right like so so you ask chat gpt a question it comes back with an answer how do you know that thing is true or not you have to be able to verify or cross check that somehow to know that that's true which is a big conundrum right because People are used to trust, like, I, I don't question my calculator when I say how much is two plus two, right? Or whatever. I, I don't go and, and, and do the, the, the thing on a napkin to see. I don't even remember to tell you how to do like, like decimal division anymore. I know. Uh, it's uh, I know. I don't either. It's embarrassing. <laughs> correct, correct. Which is another problem. We should talk about uh, technology, right? Uh, and, and is that as you facilitate or as basically... What is beautiful about technology is that it expands us. It expands our intellect. It, it expands our vision, our capabilities. We can we can get into a car and go at 150 miles an hour. If you run, you can never accomplish that. We can fly. We 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 have telepathy. We can communicate with anyone anywhere in the world at any time. You are in Texas. I'm in New York. We're having this conversation. This is enabled by technology. This is the beautiful side about technology. And, and this is why I'm in love with technology on that way. But at the same, and at the same, on, on the, earth, the, the, the flip side of that coin is that technology cripples us. And there is this very, very interesting uh, uh, myth from uh, Plato is in, in the, I think it's called the uh, Phaedrus of, of Plato, and is the myth of Thoth and Tammuz. Thoth is the god of language, and he, he was known as a, mm, 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 Hermes by the Greeks, and, and he is Mercury of the Romans, and he is the father of language and intelligence. And Tammuz, who was a, a wise king from Egypt, uh, was sitting there one day and the god Thoth came to him and he's all excited. Oh, uh, King Thomas, look at what I created. I created something that is going to help people. And the memory of people is called a, a writing. And then the King Thomas goes and says, no, you haven't created something that is going to help or aid people's memory. It's something that is going to make people forget because they're going to rely now on writing and they're not going to exercise their memory anymore. So you can see that both sides of the of the of the of the of the coin, right? On one hand, we made a way where we can transcend that with our memories through putting it in symbols and writing. 
So we can see what our ancestors were thinking 5,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago and so on because of this technology. But at the same time, it creates atrophy. Like we don't know how to do long, long, long decimal division anymore, right? Like we don't know. Think about, for example, uh, if tomorrow Google Maps goes away and you're invited by a friend that lives in the middle of Ohio somewhere. I'm in trouble. Would you go? All of us are in trouble because we forgot how to navigate. So, so all these technologies, whatever it is, they have two sides. They they enhance us, but they also create uh, atrophy on us, on our capabilities because we don't exercise them, and. Especially with these kind of technologies, I think the biggest problem is not the technology itself, but its centralization. So it's not only that you lost your, your ability to navigate, but you, you now depend on this central, very powerful entity for your navigation, and they may not have your best interest in mind when, when they come to this, right? So, so it's not only that I lost the ability to navigate, but now I depend to this mega corporation, this gigantic ent entity, for 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 me to know how to move around the world, and and that's a huge dependency. What happens when this thing goes kaboom, or right, like we we have a solar flare and light goes off on planet Earth? Like we go back to the Stone Age in two days. Mm. So that those those things, and 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 we're very happy to. To adopt all these technologies because they're cool and they're in fashion and today and so on but you never people never stop to think about for a second what are the long-term consequences of those things uh, so imagine imagine gutenberg's print which is the most is brilliant and we're standing on the shoulders of giants when someone did that it's so obvious and so beautiful but it's so simple right is you're just like printing on paper with types made out of wood or metal. Look at the impact that that thing had in the modern world. Like it took down the, 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 the Catholic church, for example. It's, that's the power of a piece of metal and a piece of paper. So if you can do that with that, imagine when you're training a model in supercomputers and it takes, and you spend a hundred million dollars to train one of these models. What is the future impact of something like that in humanity? It is mind blowing. We cannot even conceive what's going to happen with that. And but no one stops for a second to question: Should we do this, right? And and the, the regular answer is what you said: Is oh, but any someone is going to do it anyway, so we better are the first ones to do it. Is is very very interesting. And, and I have this love-hate relationship with, with technology because of that, because I, I think about these things and I cannot conceive what's going to happen, right? But, but you can imagine very dark scenarios. And at the same time, you can imagine a rosy world where we use these things for human betterment. But that doesn't happen very often. It's true. I mean, I, I think we eventually end up making technology beneficial to human beings, but I, I would tend to agree that oftentimes we we tend to jump off that cliff without knowing where we're going to land. I think that happens pretty often. I mean, again, there's no better example of the Manhattan Project. Let's see. Win World War II or literally set the atmosphere on fire and and extinguish all life on the planet forever. That was one of the riskiest decisions ever, maybe the riskiest decision of all time. I'm not sure if we've ever had something where like we weren't quite sure, are we going to make a bomb or are we going to destroy the entire world? That, that was an, it's, it's almost like a, a plot from a James Bond film or something of this nature. It's madness. It's total madness. And we went through that, right? It's uh, madness. And it took us to like with, with the, with the Bay of Peaks incident, right? And the missiles crisis in, in, in in 62 i think uh, 63 that, 63 i think 63, it was yeah. uh, we were at this from from having a nuclear war with the with the russians right 
and we could be very very close to that now right like like it's it's crazy that we we live in this world where we take these emotions and and, and we behave like 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 neolithic people with with just banging people around right it's crazy it's, it's it's an interesting concept because it seems like that our compendium of human knowledge has grown exponentially over the past couple of hundred years. You could even say over the past couple of decades. And yet our, I don't even know what to call it. I would say something like our human soul hasn't necessarily matured along with it. In other words, imagine we gave monkeys access to firearms right i mean they'd that probably shoot everybody and the thing is we would we would look and say well yeah of course they're monkeys they don't know what they're doing and it's like right but when do we <laughs> when mm -hmm. what happens if monkeys actually invented firearms i know that sounds mm -hmm. crazy but like what happens if they just invented them they're like mm -hmm. well they're monkeys they shouldn't have those and i'm gonna go okay cool but like at what point do we say well, we're just human beings. We're just one theoretical evolutionary step above apes or, you know, whatever you want to believe. But at what point have we sort of outgrown our, you know, our capabilities as a human being with our intellect as a human being? Does that make sense? I mean, you, you can sort of yeah, yeah. measure the human, the human experience in a number of different ways. And intellect, I think, is is one of the ways that we tend to measure it because it makes us look really good. We, we've done all this amazing stuff and humanity's pushing so far forward. I'm going, right. But are we allowing our souls, for some definition of the word soul, are we allowing our souls enough time to catch up to where our intellect right. has gone, right? right? And, oh, yeah. And that, that's, that's another thing that is super interesting, right, is that we have taken reason to be the absolute God and decider on every situation that we have. And, and this is something that started cooking probably at the Renaissance because you had this very oppressive system of the Catholic church. Right. And basically the only thing that mattered and, and was acceptable was the texts, the, the sacred texts of the Bible. We even lost the legacy of our ancestors, our Greek and, 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 and Roman ancestors, they were gone. And we have to be very thankful to, to the Muslims for, for keeping them alive. Because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't know about Plato or Pythagoras or any of these guys because they were not valid because the only thing valid was the Bible, right? And, and thanks to the Muslims and their, their vision, we, we were able to rescue that. So we, we should be eternally in debt to them because of that, because they kept our legacy. Uh, so there was a big imbalance where, where you have this center, big center of power that controls everything, uh, all Europe and all Americas. And, and at some point, like during, during the French Revolution, there was a... Uh, a coup against the church and this oppressive idea uh, was uh, toppled and they put instead the goddess reason literally what they did is they took the churches the, the catholic churches in 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 france and they named them the temples of reason and what they did is they got these french women and they parade this French woman naked on the streets as the goddess of reason. We, uh, have, her, we have her at Staten, uh, or sorry, in uh, at Liberty Island in New York. Yes. Lady Liberty. Yeah. She's not naked, unfortunately, or <laughs> fortunately, I don't know. <laughs> She's definitely would attract not. more tourists. Let me tell you, it may attract more tourists, but I believe, especially at the time we were when we were gifted that by France, I'm pretty sure the Puritan backlash would have been heavy. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> so so, I think everything is a matter of balance, because when you take reason, the problem with reason is that it comes actually from ratio. And and is reckoning is counting, so. 
all you can do with reason is at the end compare quantities. That's where they come from, the, the word comes from. And so anything that you cannot measure or quantify, you don't have a mental model to deal with that. So everything that is not quantifiable, you cannot reason about it. And it's not because it's irrational, because I think that that has a bad rap. It's because it is irrational. It's orthogonal to reason. So, so there is no mode in our head to reason about it because it's unquantifiable. Uh, and, and when you do that, then you're reducing the world to numbers. And by the way, democracy is the perfect governmental system for a system of numbers, right? Because if God is the number, then you're basically ruling by numbers. Like the majority, I'm, I'm counting votes, and now I know who is. But, but think about the consequence when, when, when you adopt a system of beliefs, what is the consequence of that? So if you look at it, then health becomes a bunch of numbers. What is your cholesterol level? What is your pressure number, right? And how educated you are, or how good are you at school becomes what is your score on the test mat and this, and, and so on and so forth. Everything becomes basically a number and you end up, what is your social security number? And you become a statistic for the system. You're just a number, right? So, so what you're doing is you're, you're removing what you cannot measure, which is the, the human spirit, qualia, right? That part, your emotions, those things are not quantifiable. Hence, they don't exist. And, and you minimize them and, and put them aside and mock them and even... Today, you talk to many materialists today, they would agree or they would they would say that consciousness is an illusion. You're, you're, it's an illusion that you're having. And, and that's so absurd. If you think about it, any, any theory about the world that we create and we can think of has to account for your own awareness because it's the only thing we know with certainty. The only thing we know is that we're aware. This world could be a dream, it could be a simulation, it could be made of atoms and, and, and space and time, but those things are hypotheses. The only True. thing with certainty that we know is that we're aware. And yet, our systems to think about and explain the world don't account for them. That, that's crazy, because we have created this world, and it's fascinating because is ideological. One, one. Uh, I don't know if I'm going like crazy with this, but uh, one of the things that I love to read about and, and see is measurement. And it sounds one of the most boring things in the world, right? Like the measurement systems that we have. But the beauty of that is that those things dictate how we think about the world. So imagine like, the, 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 the first uh, uh, systems of measurement were based on our bodies, right? So you have the qubit, which is probably one of the oldest measurements that we know. The qubit is the distance from the elbow to the middle finger when you extend your arm. And people used to measure things with that or the foot, right? And, and for, for many practical purposes, it's good enough. Right, like even when I'm hanging paintings or doing things, I use qubits and to measure things, and and things look kind of straight when you do that. Uh, so so think about the ideological uh, statement and the political statement of introducing the metric system. What is interesting about the metric system is that it removes us from being the center of the world and puts this abstract thing that is a 10 million of the distance between the quarter meridian uh, that goes through Paris. That thing is super abstract, right? And, and that was the definition of the meter at the time of the, of the French Revolution, right? That's what they were trying to adopt was the metric system, uh, which is decimal system is not even the best. Like you can argue that the duodecimal system, the counting in terms of 12 is way superior than 10 because yeah i mean you if, if, if you if you get used to it base 12 is way easier to do things in than base 10 that's true 
yeah and, and you have more more like like it's divisible by my my more by more numbers right so you can divide it by two three four uh, and six ten is only two and five that's why you cannot buy half a dozen of eggs right because it's not it's not a new number so it is superior the other thing that it has and the meat is that oh it's very good because we have 10 digits and we can count with 10 digits yeah but you're using both hands if you're a merchant and you use a duodecimal system i can use one hand to handle my mer mer merchandise and look at how many phalanges you have in the four in the, these four fingers you have 12 and this is your counter so I can count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. This is half a dozen. This is two thirds of a dozen. This is one third of a dozen. And all of them, you don't need decimals to express that. You have one symbol, symbol to express those quantities, which are the ones that we use day by day, right? It's an interesting so way. You, of, it's an interesting way of putting things to mirror some of what you've been saying. I, I find this tremendously interesting. But first of all. Obviously, we have numbers to measure things because a lot of people find comfort in numbers. I mean, I'm an engineer, you're an engineer. Clearly, we don't have a problem with numbers. But at the same time, you're kind of dropping into more metaphysics, which I really, really enjoy because this is, this is one of the places where we have a really difficult time explaining these things where it's like, yeah, but how, how does one measure the things that are unmeasurable? And it's like, well, you don't. That's the problem. That is the problem. And the problem is that the measurement systems in place don't take these things into account that we know to be the case. We know for a fact, like exactly like you said, we know for a fact that we are aware. Okay, measure it. It's like, but you can't. You can't, you can't do that. That's the problem. So it's already subjective. the only thing that you know is the one thing that can't be, well, it's one of the things that can't be measured. Mm -hmm. um, so you're already starting off with a, with a, a difficult place. The phalanges, that's an interesting one. I, I didn't actually count it up, but I guess it's true. I mean, basically you've got three on four fingers and yeah. three times four is 12. You can literally go through 12 through each one of them. That's amazing. And, and you count with your thumb. Right. And, and then, then you just, you just move up each one of them with your thumb. That's, that's incredible. You actually have base 12 built into your hand. I didn't realize that. Right. And it's true. Um, we, we, obviously we went with base 10 because we have, we have 10 fingers, but you know, there's 12, you know, there, there's, there's effectively twelve markers on on four fingers. Correct. Which and is you have one one hand notably free. more efficient. Yes, <laughs> and is is that's why ours. That's the other thing in, at the, the French Revolution. They were so dogmatic about the base ten, the, the the decimal system, that they decided to change the time to be measured in 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 ten hours. So you had like ten hours, and each of them had a hundred minutes. And you can you can find faces of clocks from the time of the French Revolution that have ten hours. Like you look for it, and you'll you'll see clocks that have ten hours. Okay. Did, People revolted. They they never adopted that. That was the the part of the of the decimal system that people completely revolted against and and never took. Okay, so 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 people did reject metric. I'll, I'll say, to be honest, I, I like the metric system better. I think it makes a little bit more sense, but you're oh. right. It does remove the human c concept, although I completely disagree with Celsius. I think <laughs> Fahrenheit is way better. I mean, I, I've had this argument a hundred times. I mean, when yeah, people say, well, well, when, well, I'll just give a quick, quick explanation. When people are talking about sort of the Celsius metric, they're going, well, it's the boiling point of water. And I'm like, it's, it's the boiling point of fresh water. It's not the boiling point of salt water. So when you tell me, well, it's the it's the thing we have the most of on the planet, wrong. That's not true. Salt water does not boil at um, at 100 and it doesn't freeze at zero. That's for starters. But for a second, the reason I, I, I'm always good about this is let's start with Kelvin, right, from absolute zero. At absolute zero, you are dead. At 100 Kelvin, you are dead. At zero Celsius, you are cold. And at 100 Celsius, you are dead. <laughs> it's never been 100 Celsius anywhere on the planet, not even close. Right. At zero Fahrenheit, you're very cold. It's below freezing. But at 100 Celsius, you're hot. And 
I find it odd that like in in the arbitrary sort of Celsius, it's like, yeah, set the temperature at 22.5. So already I, I'm like, I'm already in this weird 22 range and then I need a 0.5 to get to roughly 72, 73 degrees. No, I'm not on like that. So I'm like, no, there's, there's not enough, there's not enough range for me to enjoy myself in this well, narrow I, band I, of I, Celsius. I really triggered you, Dave. You went on a <laughs> rampage with that, man. I, I can't help it. That the temperature one is the one that always gets me. <laughs> and actually to, to, to round up the story of the metrical system. Yeah. So, so they, I think it was in 2000, 18 or something like that, they did the, the next version or the, the next iteration on the definition of what a meter is. And now the, the decimal system is just based in universal physical constants and is ratios between them. So a meter today is the speed light in the vacuum divided by, I think it's called the hyper transition frequency of cesium which is an atom so 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 imagine imagine how absurd, like we went from using the foot and, and the arm and our 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 body to measure things right. to a fraction of the distance between the the north pole and the equator and now is this incomprehensible thing which is completely abstract so, so basically, and, and it's a beautiful allegory when you think about it, what we end up, ended up doing was detaching, it became so, so abstract that we detached the body from the head. Right. And what a beautiful, and, and think about how poetic this is, what is the symbol of the French Revolution? The guillotine. What does it do? It severs the head from the body. It, it's, it's, it's a perfect tool for doing it right like it's like you're literally detaching the head from the body as jose, the ultimate statement of reason jose you're blowing my mind you are really blowing <laughs> my mind right now I, i've never thought of any of this that's incredible um wow wow yeah and i think the guy who invented the guillotine also died in the guillotine or that's, he died on the guillotine oh, as well. yeah. that's so brutal <laughs> god that's terrible <laughs> and um, I, so now that word is, do you want to talk about like a little bit between heliocentrism and, and a, a, a geocentrism? Yeah, Which let's is, do it. Which is related. Oh, so, it's, they're, they're very related. Neither one yes. of them are true, but they're very related. It is, it's part of the same, right? So think about like what I was saying is that the way you measure the world and the way you, the, the standards that you use to see the world determine the ideology of who you are. So when we thought that the earth was the center of the universe, we were at the center of the universe. We were important ideologically because you know what? We're in paradise. We're in the, in the, in the, in the, in the center of creation. And we were that. As soon as you remove that, and all of a sudden you are just on this small minor planet running around this small star in a lost arm of a galaxy among billions of galaxies around you, you're insignificant. So think about what that does to your psyche. And, and, and it's very interesting, right? Because the more we expand our knowledge, you can look at it in two ways. It's, yeah, we're expanding our knowledge, but we're becoming smaller relative to our, to our knowledge. We're becoming more and more insignificant relative to what we know. Uh, so, and it's funny, right? Because for all intents and purposes, thinking that the earth is the center of the universe is perfectly good and valid. Like thinking that the sun, that the earth rotates around the sun. Yeah, it, it, it makes easier to us to calculate where is going to be the moon tomorrow and Neptune, where we're in the sky. How many people are looking for Neptune? In, you cannot even see it, right? Like <laughs> with your bare eye. But, but it's, it's a mathematical artifact because you can model, you can model the motion the, the, of, of, of the revolving uh, uh, objects in, in space, thinking about Earth in the center, that's fine. It's more complicated, right? Like you need more, more, more numbers to do this, but it's fine. It's, and, and by the way, it is the same because as you said, yeah, the Earth doesn't revolve around the sun either. It does, kind of, but but 
the sun is remo revolving around the... So you think about it, everything is moving through space, but the frame of reference that you take to measure things is not only a facility for doing calculations, it has a very deep ideological root, which is where is your place in the universe? Uh, and, and, and that has huge impacts, right? Like, like, so when, when you, when you start measuring things only in, in, when you measure happiness in terms like they have the happiness index and you know about it, right? Like, and, and you look at these, the, the wealthiest countries are not where the happiness index is the highest, right? Like you look at the Nordic countries that they're socially perfect, wink, wink in quotes, whatever, that's where you have them, the, the highest rate of suicides. Right, so people are clearly not happy there. Mm. So, so it, it's, it's super interesting when when you start to think about all these things and you put them in concert and and you see how what the connections are. And I think I was listening to your last podcast with uh, about the education. Yeah, with Hannah. Yeah, that was fascinating. That was I truly enjoyed that one. And if you think about it. Part of what we do in, in our education is that we're very mental in the way we, we, we educate people. People learn how to add and subtract and kind of and read and write and all these mental skills, but you never acknowledge your emotions, for example. You don't have a class where they teach you to understand and comprehend your emotions. And why am I fearful or why am I sad or why am I happy? You, you don't know. Those things run in automatic mode and, and we don't know why. Like, so so the, the consequence of that is that people don't know how to control their emotions. They're, they're move emotions from movement, the same word, right, for the same root. Uh, people are moved by their emotions in ways that they cannot help because they don't understand them and they don't know how to balance them and so on. So, so you end up with, with rages and all this and unhappiness because people, that's probably the first thing that you should learn in school is understand yourself, know thyself. And, and we don't learn that. We learn about how to add and how to subtract and so on. And then the other thing that I was listening, I love that podcast. And, and it made me think that what we learn in school is what to think, not how to think. I couldn't agree more. That's that's probably the that's probably the bulk of what Hannah and I talked about. In a nutshell, yeah. is it's not student first, and I couldn't agree with you more. That you you really learn this is this is what you're supposed to think, but you never actually learn how to think. I couldn't agree more. Correct. And I think in in in, in three years in a good environment, you could teach people how to be autodidactic. So they can learn whatever the hell they want and they don't need a system to tell them what they have to think. But if I'm interested in math or physics or how dogs bark or whatever, I have a mechanism to try to understand that. And that should be the standard of education should be that. Like people should be self thinkers. I agree with you. It's interesting though, what you just, just said um, previously, which was about learning about ourselves and not understanding how to control emotions and various things of that nature. Honestly, <laughs> I struggled with that growing up. I really did. I struggled with not knowing myself. I struggled with controlling emotions when I was growing up. And um, it took a long time to learn those, th that, that particular skill set. I, I think I would have been, I think armed when I was very, I think if I was armed with that skill set very young, very, very young, and I mean, I'm talking first grade, second grade, um, I think that things would have turned out notably easier in various aspects of, of, uh, of a lot of people's lives. Well, I'm, I'm speaking about myself, so my life definitely, but I think if a lot of people were armed with that, I think we would have uh, notably less incidents of whatever it is that are creating these people to be unhappy in the first place. Right. But there is a reason why they're called emotions, right? And is that... <laughs> I think I don't think I don't, I don't think I would it's interesting I'm sorry I didn't mean to to j jump in but I don't really think the emotion itself is bad or good 
I think emotions are not negative or positive, but it's the reaction thereof. Like it's, it's fine to be angry. It's fine to be jealous. Like those are standard emotions that people would say, well, those are negative emotions. They're not negative emotions. Those are normal human emotions. That's, that's the full range. But how you react to those emotions, that can be very negative or very positive. Um, Correct. And again, I'll just I'll just speak for myself instead of everybody else. But I really wish I was armed with with tools to be able to deal with those things when I was much younger as well. Yeah, absolutely. And the funny thing about emotions, right, is that they're called emotions because they move you. They they're, they're forces that that compel you to act in a way or another. Right. So, so if you're, if you're, you're, you're feeling fearful, you run, right. Or mm -hmm. if you're feeling anger, you hit uh, whatever it's, but the funny thing when you don't understand them is that the reaction, you're going to have that reaction, but then the beauty of not understanding them for, for, for a population is that I can manipulate your emotions because I can bombard you with advertisement and propaganda and all these things, right. And political rhetoric. And I can make, I can move you. So, so, so from the point of view of, 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 of the system as a whole is not good for you to know what, what, how to control, look, how, if you learn how to control your emotions, because all of a sudden I cannot move you. I cannot manipulate you with my, with my sophisms and my rhetoric. So, so it's very convenient. And I think a part of, of the reason why, why we perceive the educational system to be in such a disarray is not is not that the system is 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 faulty i think it's working perfectly for its real purpose not for its stated purpose that is to have dumb people that i can control and i can send them to war and things like that well we're both technologists how do we fix this this is what we do for a living we problem solve for a living we just happen to use software to do it how do we fix this? What, what's, what, what are your ideas? And for that matter, um, even besides what are your ideas, are, are, there, are there better ways of doing these things that you saw in Colombia compared to the ones that we, we do in the United States? I mean, I, I think we should look in all corners and all directions for, for solutions to this. It's a human problem, not a country problem. No, oh, absolutely. Like, I think, yeah, the, the first thing is to stop thinking about borders and these like imaginary lines on maps that it's only it's only a strategy to divide people against each other that's at the end what they are like nothing else uh, so i think i agree with you that's the first thing is this is a global problem and i think education is is the fundamental thing if, if we don't utilize these technologies and and these like for example the the, the idea that you were talking about like having these using YouTube or video, like the remote video to, uh, I think that's beautiful, right? Like you could reach a lot of people with uh, good ideas. And so, uh, so I think step number one to me is education. Like we, we have to change the way, the way kids are raised and, and it's a matter of balance at the end is technology is not good or bad, right? It's what we do with it. Sure. But but if we only use technology, then we forget that we have a heart and and because we don't understand it and and, and then we neglect it. Uh, there is, I don't know if you know this writer, he, he's an Argentinian writer called Ernesto Sabato. He wrote a book called uh, The Tunnel. It's probably his most famous book. And he, he was invited in Rio de Janeiro to a conference and about uh, talking about social problems. And this was, I don't know if you've been in Rio, Rio is this spectacular place. It's like one of the most gorgeous cities in the world. Yeah. Is this bay full of like these rocks that grow out of the ocean, right? Like, <laughs> And, and, and you have this city with these beautiful beaches. It's beautiful. And, but there is a lot of poverty in, in, in Brazil. And what has happened in Brazil is that like the front where the beach is and all this is where you have the high rises and the wealthy people live. So, so the poor people have been relegated to back on the mountains. But curiously, they have the best views of the city By because far. they're up. Yeah, it's called the favelas, 
and they live there. And so there was this this convention that happened, and he was invited. He's a social critic, and he was invited to talk at this five star hotel in Rio in one of these rocks. And he's there, and I, it marked me what he said. It was so so profound. He said something along these lines. He said, "So we're talking about." the problems of the world here and how we can use technology to solve these problems. But look at this city. We're in a five-star hotel here and we have running water. Across the window, across the, the city, you can see there the favelas. They don't have running water. We obviously know how to bring water to the top of the mountains. So the problem is not technological. And I think that that is so profound. Uh, because it tells you what it is, right? Like it's, we're trying to use our engineering, hyper-rational mind. And of course we can use that, but we have to see how we focus these weapons, these technological tools that we have in order to solve these problems without forgetting that what we're, we're trying to solve at the end is not technological. It's, it's, some, it's a matter of the heart. Mm. And this goes back to sort of about 20 minutes ago when we were really talking about measurements, it's really, really difficult to measure these things. And that's the trouble is, again, we, we want to we use this technology to be able to solve these problems. And it's like, that's not an engineering problem. We know how to do this. Of course, mm -hmm. it's not an this is a This is a human problem. And, and you're going to say, well, well how, how do we measure that problem? You don't. You don't measure right. it. You just have to solve it. There, it's not about measurement, which is interesting I think that we've really gotten away from that, uh, especially in the in the past, at least in the past several decades, as as technology has continued to march on, et cetera. I mean, I think, in my opinion, one of the more interesting advancements is cars, and the reason I say that is that that was a, I mean, a hundred years ago, that was a very very new technology in the nineteen twenties, very new technology. Uh, entirely mechanical driven, 100% mechanical engineering, top to bottom. And yet these days, mechanical engineering is not, not used very often in cars at all. I mean, some of it is, but most of the car these days is electrical engineering and computer science. You're really just driving a gigantic computer. Um, and so we've really, again, as you say, we, we've sort of morphed these things into, to what's, what's the, the, the topic of, or sorry, the, uh, technology of of current current interest of fashion yeah <laughs> of fashion perfect uh, the technology mm -hmm. of current fashion and then we tend to look at society and societal problems in that in that way there was nothing wrong with previous cars you could make them exactly as they were in the 1950s you could make them just like that you could make them uh you could make massive improvements on the engine in the mechanical sense such that they're they're very fuel efficient, among other things, and yet we still make them into these giant computers. And even the parts where it's like, no, you really need fuel injection. It's much better for the car. It's it's it lasts longer. There's some some fuel savings in there, et cetera. I'm going, great, but you didn't just use a computer for that. You used a computer basically for the entire car. We we changed absolutely everything in the car to to now be run on these electrons as opposed to sort of these these mechanical engineering and analog principles. And in that particular sense, are we getting further away from what it means to be human or are we just evolving as humans? I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm asking, <clears throat> asking you, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, I don't know. Like the, the, the promise of technology is that as, as technology is to our service, we would have more time of leisure and I don't see that happening anytime soon, man. <laughs> Like you see, like it's the same, right? Like you, you're just pushing the problem somewhere else. And and by the way, what we're doing is we're creating complexity along the way, which is a horrible thing to do because things are less and less understandable every day, right? So that's one of the problems of ChatGPT. It comes up with something and try to figure out why in the world it came up with that is untrackable. Like you, you, you don't know. So. But the same thing, I remember the first car I had was like, I was 16 and I had this car. It was an Italian piece of shit car called a Topolino, which means the little mouse. And was a car 
that like you could see like two people stretch like like it was like two people tied on that car and it was a piece of garbage that car like it broke every other day and just just to tell you for a moment like on a sideway one day i got 20 people in that car <laughs> 20 people 20 20 teenagers on that car is it was so many people that the wheels were touching the chassis of the car like you could hear like <laughs> and and that's probably one of the reasons why i broke every other day right like that 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 could have something to do with that wow. anyway that car because it broke so much i fixed it myself so i i knew how to disassemble that car into pieces like take the engine out and everything out and put it together again, and I understood in my head, I had the model of how this thing worked. Uh, today's car, I opened the hood, and I have no idea what's going on there anymore. There is no idea. Same thing happens with computers. I'm old enough that I, I remember we used to assemble our own computers. You used to buy like these cards that you used to put on the motherboard, and, and they had jumpers that they were called the DMA, direct memory access jumpers that you used to configure to see in which part of the bus and the memory bus they were running and so on. And I could disassemble my computer and put it back together. I understood every single part of the computer, what it was doing and whatnot. I'm scared to freaking open my MacBook Pro at all because I don't know how to close it ever again. Like, I don't, it's magical. I don't understand how it works anymore. So as you introduce complexity, we become more detached from what is happening there and less and less experts have the, the knowledge on how to use these things, which make these things less democratic, right, in a way. It's true. I mean, I, it really de I, I imagine it really depends on how you look at it, right? I mean, especially in our particular industry, computer science. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of high level languages. I remember doing C. C sucks. I, I, I don't like it. I had to do all my own memory. I mean, you, you've done, you did even deeper level C than I do with compilers and whatnot. Uh, I tinkered in the kernel every now and again, not really knowing what I was doing, but um, kind of playing around. But the truth of the matter is like, you, you have to do all kinds of memory management. You have to do all these crazy things that no programmers think about that today, or at least None of the, most of them don't. Java takes care of that for you or Python or, or, or Go or even, even, you know, JavaScript, yeah, JavaScript objective C, even the, even the higher yeah. level C's, they it really takes care of all that stuff that you needed to do, which is interesting because I've done, I don't, at this point, 25 years in technology, I've probably done thousands of interviews. I know engineers that I, I did end up hiring a couple of these, but they really didn't understand how memory worked in a computer. They've just never had to do it. They've never had to, 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 to do any type of reference counting. They've never had to do, you know, memory management. They've never had to malloc anything that they don't even know what <laughs> the malloc call is for the listeners. I'm nerding out over here, so don't worry about it. But they count never how had many to do... bytes. Of, yeah, count, yeah. Sorry, count how many bytes of memory this this particular da data structure takes. Like... Right. Or for that matter, create your own data structure such that it's like, yeah, because I can't, I, I don't know if I'm going to have continuous or contiguous memory blocks. So I'm going to have right. to create some. So there's all sorts of things that you had to do way back in the day. And, and by, by way back in the day, I really only mean like 25, 30 years tops. But these days, I don't miss a lot of that. But the truth of the matter is it's made things much more accessible if if we were still on C today, we would have, my guess is one one hundredth of the programmers that we do. There's already a programmer shortage. We'd still we, we'd have one one hundredth of the programmers that we do today because people would just be over it so fast. It's like, wait, I have to learn assembly in C. This this is terrible. Um, not to mention, oh, I, you know, it needs to run on a MacBook, which is an ARM, and it needs to run on an Intel, and and it also needs to run on phones, which means that I have to learn different types of, of chip assembly. No way. I'm not doing that. And so one of the things I'll just say in that particular realm is, yeah, I mean, I think, I think adding some abstraction to various technologies is a good thing. But I agree that you end up really – you end up kind of, kind of pulling yourself away from really understanding, you know, how, how do the bits and bytes get where they go? 
What are logic gates? What does it mean when something's open versus closed or half open and half closed? And so each one of these things where it's like, yeah, there, I mean, you can really understand how electrical impulses are transmitted from your keyboard into your computer, from your computer into memory, from memory, mm -hmm. you know, from to, to, to wireless or Wi-Fi, from Wi-Fi across the internet and so on and so forth. And you just, you sort of end up with this. I mean, I'm, I'm using this as sort of an allegory, but right. you basically end up with this thing where it's like, I don't really understand how it works, but I know it works. And the, the truth is, for some point of our previous, in points of our previous conversation, I think we can sort of say the same thing with the human experience, right? Some things are notably easier. I'm glad that we don't have to go, you know, hunter gatherer uh, right. for, for foraging food. I'm glad that mega agriculture exists. I'm, I'm really happy for a lot of these technologies. Right. But at some point, yeah, we've definitely lost some human experiences along the way. Uh, right. And, and yeah, you, you can see both like the plus and cons of every. The, the problem with complex systems, like what you, you, could, you could think about the computer, right? Or you, could, you can think about a society, is that at the end, a complex system runs on faith. And let me explain what I mean by that. If I'm going to program in a high level uh, language, I have faith that the layers underneath that high level language are working fine. And I trust them. Same thing happens in society. When you create a complex society, the system is based on faith. So, so if you have these long supply chains, you are putting yourself in a vulnerable position in which you are trusting that these complex mechanisms work for you. Uh, now, if your foundations are not solid and you don't understand how all these mechanisms work, the day they, they collapse, you're at the mercy of the elements because you, like at the time of the pandemic, I, I rented a house upstate and I went fishing and so on. I started going on the, in, in the, in the little forest around, around the house where I was. And one day I found this little bear and he's one of the most horrifying experiences I ever had in my life. It was very cute. Don't take me wrong beautiful bear but i know that the mom is around <laughs> lurking around and i realized that i'm completely unprepared to live on the wilderness like if you put me and that bear for a night in the middle of a like a winter night in the middle of that place that thing has more chances of survival than i do because he's adapted to that and i rely and i'm at the mercy of all the complex of the complexity of the society that we have built and but there is nowhere like nowhere in our curriculum goes like how do you make fire like how, how do you take a two pieces of, of wood and, and and rub them together and, and make fire how, how do you do that we, we have no idea so so we're we're totally at the mercy of the system where we live in and and it's very good, right? Like, I, of course, I love I love to have this technology and the comforts and all these things is awesome, but but we forget the price, the heavy price that we're paying for this, and and we are relying on the system that may as well one day not be there, for natural reasons, for mismanagement reasons, for economic reasons, for whatever, right? For a failure in one of the atomic plants like who knows right like we we don't know but that we take for granted the the stability of the system that we live in that that's an illusion that's not real that that's so brittle the system we live in the social system we have arranged is so brittle and which is scary to think about that but but is the reality right for sure okay final question if you could will a technology into existence, having something to do with your field, what would that technology be? Mm, it has to do with my field? Yes, because otherwise people pick teleportation every time. <laughs> uh, Rick and Morty's <laughs> portal gun. Damn it. Uh, Oh, 
Boom. Uh, probably. You know what I would love to do? I would love to have this holographic system where I could get the the image of the library of Alexandria and I could recreate the library of Alexandria and I could read those books and understand those books and see what the hell we lost there. Because I think there is a lot of knowledge and it's not like, I know guys, it's not like, oh yeah, but we have cell phones. No, no, no. It's all this deep philosophy of people who didn't have television. So they have to sit down at night because they didn't have light and, and they have to sit down across a bonfire and think about the human experience and think deeply because they were as smart as we are about these things. And they came with so much wisdom that we lost. And I would love to see what the hell was that. Okay. That's interesting. That's definitely an interesting one. Is there a specific reason that you chose library of Alexandria? Because you know what is the thing that I love about the, your podcast the most? The name. <laughs> because imagine the guy who came up with fire like the first time how to make fire or the wheel or these things that we take for absolute granted, they are the real giants. Like, And it's these people that we consider out there. They, they didn't use pants and sneakers, so they were like primitive beings. But they are the real giants that made it possible for us to be talking here. And the problem is that we, they spoke in a different language, right? They, they didn't speak in the language of reason and precision, but they spoke in metaphor and allegory and symbol. Yeah. And, and we have a hard time understanding that. And, and I think part of trying to um, crack the, the, to crack the, the mystery of who we are and, and why we are what we are. Humans have been thinking about this for many, many generations, but they didn't have a way to write it. And the closest thing we have is the library of Alexandria before it was burned down. Excellent point. Uh, Jose, this has been amazing. Let me ask, is there, is there anywhere um, that you would want people to find you or interact with you online, anything like that, Twitter or any of that stuff? Want to give well, out your I don't know if info. people want to. I don't know if people want to find me. <laughs> As my friends, they don't want to find me. But uh, so I have a website where I have a, a bunch of poetry and short stories, and my photography uh, is Jose Maria Barrera. That's that's a mouthful. It's J O S E M A R I A. B A R R E R A dot com. I think I even misspelled that shit. I don't know. Jose Maria Barrera, correct? Correct. Okay. Dot com. I, th I think most people can end up getting that. It's two R's in Barrera. And there, yes. well, technically there's three, but two R's in a row for the first ones. <laughs> right. But that said, um, Jose, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Um, Wow, we'll have to do this again. Seriously, you 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 really really tweaked my melanin on a couple of different things during this conversation. Thank you. Anytime, man. It was a real honor, and and thank you so much. I really enjoy it. Thank you. Oh, and for those listening, as a reminder, and as always, we have been standing on the shoulders of giants. Thank you. <laughs>